Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and I hope all of you are having a fantastic day because, hey, you know, we have a great show for you where in the second part of the program, we will be doing computer and technology news where anything newsworthy, news related, we will be talking about. And trust me, lots to talk about, including the fact that, uh, you know, one thing I'm really interested in is that a company called iFixit, they uh, they do teardowns of different pieces of technology. Well, they did a teardown of a $2,300 Magic Leap 1. So we're going to figure out what, uh, you know, what they found. And that means that, hey, if you have to repair it, iFixit is generally the best place to go to uh, you know get instructions. So that, as well as the Sony iBo, we're going to talk about robotic dogs and so much more here on Computer America. But in the first part of the program, as usual, we do have a guest, and we will be talking about well uh, cameras. And not just cameras, but uh, ones that strap onto your glasses and they look really cool and really excited to talk about the company as we talk with OrCam. So, uh, yeah, so all that and more. And uh, before we get started with our guests, one quick thing, and that is ComputerAmerica.com. That's where you'll find a link to our guest website. That is where you'll find any articles, videos, anything that we show here on the show will be right there. Also, be sure to check out the social media contest brought to you by Logitech and the live video feed, which you can also find over at Twitch.tv. So... All that and more. There you go. Oh, oh, also, just yesterday we published a review of a drone and uh, and a canless air system. All fun stuff. So hey, check that out when you get a chance. But let's go ahead, jump right into our interview, and uh, waste no time. So joining us by phone today is the one, the only, Dr. Brian Walensky, and he is an optometrist and a uh, and a consultant for OrCam Technologies, who make well the OrCam. So uh, let's go ahead and welcome him onto the show. Brian, how you doing? Welcome onto Computer America. Doing well. Thank you very much for having me. Perfect. Beautiful day here in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to hear it. And uh, yes. Yeah. So, uh, and of course, you're coming in loud and clear. That's just what we like to hear. So let's go ahead and get some basics. Uh, you know, before we get started, for anyone out there who has not heard of OrCam, uh, could you please give us a little bit of background on why the company was started and then a little bit of your background? You know, why did you, uh, you know, why were you brought on board with, uh, with OrCam? Sure. So um, OrCam formed in uh, 2010 with the purpose of creating an assistive technology for people who are blind or visually impaired. The founders of the company, uh, Professor Amnon Shashua and Ziv Abaram, uh, had another company in the past that worked with computer vision uh, for automobiles, which is today what's in autonomous driving and they're looking into. So they took computer vision and artificial intelligence and wanted to create something on a wearable platform for people who are blind or visually impaired to assist them. And they started in 2010 came out with their prototype in about 2012 and launched the device as a pre-launch in 2013 and then launched fully in 2015 after all of their research. Very, very cool. And of, of course, uh, for anyone out there who is watching the video portion, we're showing some of the product demos. Uh, just saw a, a young woman drank a lot of olive oil, so that was a lot of fun. But <laughs> go ahead and uh, and kind of explain further about this idea of you know how technology can help the visually impaired. Because uh, you know, for anyone out there watching the video, we can see what the product looks like, but. From you know, just the people listening, describe what uh, OrCam actually put out because it looks like something that is strapped onto a pair of glasses or otherwise. I mean, talk about the product itself and what they eventually brought to market. Sure. So 
you know, as an optometrist, I have lots of patients that come to me and they're looking for solutions to different problems that someone who's blind or visually impaired has. One of those is getting information, specifically reading. That's the hardest thing for anyone to do. When I was a student back in optometry school, all we had was magnifiers and maybe something that blew something up and made it bigger. Um, people also tend to get a little bit of reading fatigue when reading that way. And so with the premise of OrCam, it's a totally different technology where it's something small, discreet. It goes on to an ordinary pair of eyeglasses. So it doesn't look like something different, not like a big magnifying lens or something that looks odd or something different. And it, the, it, it's based on uh, exactly what it is. It's about the size of my finger, weighs less than about an ounce. Uh, it has a uh, 13 megapixel camera with two little LED lights. Uh, and it has a magnet that then attaches to any pair of eyeglasses. And what someone does is if they want the, the device is able to read text to them off of any surface. It's able to have product recognition, so recognizing products, everyday products in the supermarket, as well as barcode reading. Uh, it as well does facial recognition. People who develop macular degeneration have a big complaint about not seeing their friends and a little social isolation where they're not recognizing somebody from across the room, and this allows them to have that facial recognition feature. So technology is really helping uh, this uh, population, people with visual impairment. Now, of course, uh, you know, being a technology show, we have heard about all this in some capacity before, but we've seen it in, you know, either full-blown, uh, of course, uh, computers with, you know, great big operating systems, lots of memory, lots of, uh, you know, lots of ways to process information quickly. You have, uh, you know, through OrCam, you've been able to miniaturize it to quite a degree. Like you said, it's about, it looks to be about the size of a finger, a couple inches long, but you know, maybe an inch high, uh, straps onto a pair of glasses, you know, to give you a better idea. It's not something that, uh, you know, you wear like a miner's cap. It's, uh, you know, it's a pretty delicate, you know, piece of equipment. How were you, I, I, and, and I guess it's a, you know, maybe a bit too much of a technical question, but, um, sure. how, how, how is this capable of, you know, kind of doing all this? It, it, obviously the engineering must've been something and, uh, you know, over the eight years that OrCam has been around, I mean, did it come out with all these features or have OrCam or has OrCam been adding to it over the years? Because, you know, did it come sure, out with this, facial this is, hmm? Yeah, this has been a development definitely over time. The original uh, OrCam, right now, what, they, what uh, the company has is something called OrCam My Eye 2.0. That's what it's called. And the original My Eye device, or the My Eye 1.0, uh, basically had a camera with a wire that connected to a battery pack. And that battery pack had all the guts of the computer and everything like that. As you mentioned, I'm not an engineer, so mm -hmm. I don't know all the specs and all that other stuff. But it is amazing, even that original instrument, that they can pack so much information into one thing. The original device was reading, then they tacked on the facial recognition, then came, you know, barcode reading and other features were added as time went on. And then amazingly, the, the OrCam My i 2.0 came out and they just miniaturized everything. And what's amazing about it is that it just works instantly. I mean, uh, how it actually works is something using a gesture. So... You don't want a cam or a camera constantly taking pictures of things. You want it to work when you want it to work. So the gesture it uses is, let's say someone wanted to read a newspaper. All someone would do is hold the newspaper about 10 to 12 inches in front of them, point forward with their finger. The camera recognizes this gesture of pointing and sees your nail. It takes a picture and instantly starts reading the text where you pointed that and of course super simple obviously the people who will be uh you know who will be using this you can't really make it uh, all that complicated because obviously you know being visually impaired they're going to want a lot of the steps kind of done for them speaking of and and of course you know we mentioned the thing that you know kind of sticks onto your glasses the actual unit um how does it kind of send the information it, does someone wear an earpiece or uh how how does one actually kind of hear the information that's being read Sure. So the unit itself does have a speaker that sits next to the ear. So it's all one piece. Okay, so the camera, uh, the, the, the actual unit that I mentioned that's the, uh, the size of the finger, the orchid has a little speaker in the back that sits uh, next to your ear and you hear the information. 
Uh, you can raise the volume if you can't hear it, or you can lower it down so other people cannot. That is very, very cool. So uh, one question that comes to mind, uh, obviously this is meant to be almost kind of natural, very fluid for the person using it, you know, no real hangups. And I guess that kind of answers the question before I ask it, but I'll still pose it. Uh, why did they feel the need to have a standalone unit as opposed to maybe an app for a smartphone? Uh, uh, you know, they were certainly around, uh, you know, in 2010. But uh, why something that kind of, you know, kind of sits on the glasses as opposed to, again, a smartphone app or another device that people can slip into their pocket? Uh, is it just because it's natural or I guess what's the reaction been to having this unit? Sure, well, two reasons. One, yes, it's more natural. Putting it on a pair of glasses is something you look at and it reads to you or it tells you what the information is around you. The other thing is, you know, a lot of other devices depend on Wi-Fi connection or depend on being connected. You know, I actually, um, being in low vision, being an optometrist, I have a good friend of mine who uh, is blind, and I asked him last year, and I said, hey, you know, I'm going on this camping trip. Do you want to come? He said, no way, I'm not going camping. I said, why? He goes, I won't be connected. Every single device that he uses is connected to Wi-Fi. Mm. So by not being attached to anything, you're very independent with it, and that's the whole point, is that you can use it anywhere at any time and not have to worry about connectivity. That is, of course, a very uh, a very interesting perspective, and we've done uh, accessibility tools here, you know, here on the show before, and it's really something that you kind of take for granted. Obviously, you know, vision accounts for a lot of the information we pull and from the world around us, and when that starts to go, we don't realize just how unfriendly we are, I guess, to people who don't have that predominant, uh, you know, kind of uh, sense. So. Uh, my next question involves, of course, you know, so you have this unit, it can do all these great things. Um, I guess, how good is it at doing all these things? Because we've seen, uh, you know, uh, tech, you know, text to speech, things like that, that are accurate up to like 80% of the time, which is near useless. That's, you know, four out of every five words. That's not enough for a sentence. Um, you mentioned facial recognition and object recognition. How accurate have you kind of found it either with people using it or maybe in your own testing um is it good at what it does sure i mean i i find that actually the ocr very very accurate yes it will sometime mix up maybe a number one versus an l or an l for an i i mean that's just inherent right. with ocr optical character recognition in general but i do find i mean this is their own proprietary uh things that they've done with their own OCR. They didn't take it from elsewhere. And that's at least what I understand. And it, it actually is doing extremely well. Um, better than when it, the original device came out. One is that they created a, a higher megapixel camera. And then second is the LED lighting will automatically come on if you're in a darker environment. So like if somebody in a restaurant can now read a menu. Uh, so again, OCR can make those mistakes like you mentioned. Uh, but I think it's doing a much better job these days. You mentioned uh, object recognition, so it doesn't do object recognition at this time. So it won't tell me if there's a chair or that's an apple or an orange. It will tell me the products. So that does product recognition by two ways. One is memorizing the product, so it does like by basically machine learning, so it learns the product, and then it knows it from then on, so that's pretty accurate. And then uh, barcode reading, where it has uh, basically hundreds of thousands of barcodes already pre-entered because we're not, remember, taking it off of the Wi-Fi or the Internet. Yeah. I, as far as facial recognition, I've, I've, sorry, I have, as far as facial recognition, I've had it work as far as about 10 feet away when somebody's walking towards me. So, and, and that's, a very, uh, that's a very interesting point as well. Uh, I, I guess I've never been really in a situation, uh, you know, I, 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 of course, have glasses. Anyone out there can see that. But, uh, you know, I've had, I've had them for so long. I guess I've never really considered what it's like to not be able to recognize someone from, you know, uh, maybe someone else approaching on the sidewalk that you know, and that could lead to, I guess, you know, a lot of social isolation, as you mentioned, because, you know, maybe they feel uh, hurt, even though you didn't even recognize them, that you didn't say hi, but um, how, how does that go? Like, like, do you have to have like a, like a police lineup and you have to line up all your friends and family and be like, all right, we're scanning, we're scanning you into the system. Here we go. Like. How, how does it kind of recognize people? 
Yeah, well, yeah, it's not going to definitely take it off of some kind of software, and it's not, you know, the government where they're trying to find somebody. <laughs> so there are privacy issues, too, you know. Uh, so, you know, you, you can recognize up to 100 people in the database, and it's very simple. It takes about anywhere from 20 to 30 seconds, even less, to recognize someone. So if there's a person in your family or friend or even one of your doctors, you want to um, uh, memorize them into the system, it's just pretty much having them stand about three to four feet in front of you, uh, a little process where you touch on the side, like a touch bar, and the camera does all the work. And it will tell you when to say the person's name, say the person's name, and then OrCam recognizes that person from then on. And either you could do it in your voice or you could do it in, in that person's voice as well. That is super and cool. And it takes, it takes about 20 seconds. That is super cool. So, so you do have some some form of registry, which I guess would be, you know, machine learning. I guess, uh, let's say you go get coffee every morning, uh, you know, make it a little awkward. It's like, oh, hey, it's the coffee guy. And it's like, eh, I really didn't want you to remember that. So, very very cool way to, uh, you know, to kind of work around that. So, it, it can identify barcodes, objects, people, printed text, of course. This thing seems uh, very, very powerful, of course, for the size that, uh, you know, for, for the compact and ease of use, that kind of thing. And again, as we mentioned, it kind of snaps on, snaps off. It's not its own dedicated pair of glasses. It's, uh, you know, be able to retrofit with a lot of different units. Talk about, uh, you know, obviously as an optometrist yourself, talk about who you'd really recommend this for. Because, you know, personally, in my day to day, I wear glasses, but I don't really have, you know, any trouble identifying people, uh, forgetting names. But you know, that's a that's a that's a Ben problem. That's not a you know memory problem. But um, I, just who would you really recommend this for? Sure. So someone who is low vision, visually impaired, or blind. Uh, the, the issue is that who's the best candidate within you know that population. Um, really, what I found, it, it can be for anyone of any age, so no matter if you have macular degeneration as an elderly person or have some sort of genetic retinal disease like something called retinitis pigmentosa, it could be for, for either or. Um, what, what I found is I had this uh, one gentleman who, and again, you could have any te technological abilities also to use this as it's easy to use, I had one gentleman who called me up to say his OrCam wasn't working. He was about 95 years old. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, he has macular degeneration. He's not seeing well. And he really only wanted it for the reading ability. That's what his goal was, is to read. So he calls me up. It's on a Friday. He says, uh, it's not working. What's going on here? What it ended up being is I spoke to him on the phone. He was using the wrong charger because it mm -hmm. does have a battery that you have to charge. So... He, he thanked me and everything, but what, the one thing he said, though, he felt like he was missing his friend, which I liked, his friend that read to him. So it's, it gave him the independence of reading. So whether you're 95 years old or 25, uh, I have, it, it can work for you. I have um, this one individual who's going to be attending college that I taught uh, how to use OrCam, which is great because not everything when she goes to school or going to college is going to be accessible to her, especially syllabuses that they want when it comes out, and she'll be able to use OrCam to instantly see the information. That is super cool. And of course, changing people's lives and, you know, that the story mm -hmm. really does, uh, you know, kind of hit it home. Right. Uh, and, and of course, there's also, uh, you know, kind of the question of... Um, you, you were just talking about Charger, and I'm kind of curious about the, uh, you know, kind of tech aspect as well. I'm assuming that this thing will be continuously updated, you know, with uh, with new firmware, new abilities, things like that. Um, do you also have to kind of register it and update it, you know, for either like security or, you know, general updates? Or is it the product out of the box? That's it. That's done. Just keep it charged and you're good and you are good to go. No, there are updates that do occur, and that's done by being pushed but through Wi-Fi. So it does connect to Wi-Fi for that reason alone. So the way it's set up is very easy also. So that elderly person who, let's say, maybe has no technological abilities, all we, we do, basically, it's not an over-the-counter item that you could just buy. So if someone is taught how to use it. Someone sent to the home, someone is about a two-hour session learning the ins and outs of it, and we hook it up to their Wi-Fi. And then any time they plug it in to charge, it automatically connects to their Wi-Fi. And any updates will automatically be pushed in. Very, very nice. And, of course, simple to use. 
Talk about you know kind of what's next for Orcan because obviously uh, you're you're adding things such as uh, you know like you said facial recognition, uh, but of course some of the technologies that you just hinted at, including uh, machine learning and you know the ability to I, I guess kind of take massive sets of data. You mentioned object re recognition, which will be coming. Uh, these things are obviously taking in data. They are sharing amongst one another. So you know the, the more customers you have, obviously the better the product will be over time. But talk about what your some specific goals for OrCam uh, looking forward. Well, looking forward, anything. I mean, the, 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 you know, I have many patients that come to me, and when they come in to me and see me for losing their sight or low vision. I get a lot of, especially elderly, telling me, I'm looking for that pair of that magic pair of glasses that's going to miraculously make me see. Unfortunately, that's not it. But what's great is we do have technology like this, um, like OrCam, like the MyEye. Really what we want is a device or technology becoming more like human visual perception. And that's really what I feel OrCam is working towards. And that's why I'm excited to work with them, because I feel that they have that passion and that's what they want. So yes, you mentioned object recognition is something to the future. Um, possibly working with voice recognition, that you can talk to it, sort of like some of these home uh, devices now right. that we can talk to. Possibly navigation. So there's a whole bunch of things coming in the future that I'm very excited about and to be part of and to introduce to others out there. And, and you know, just the, the first, sometimes when I really like a product, uh, you know, ideas come to my mind and one of them is, and I'm not sure how hard or impossible this could be, but maybe in the future, obviously, uh, things like doorbell cameras are a thing. Uh, maybe if you were able to, you know, kind of apply the same, maybe quote unquote skill to uh, like a ring doorbell and be able to, you know, let's say someone rings the doorbell, someone with vision wouldn't be able, you know, wouldn't maybe ideally pull out their phone to look at who's, you know, ring their doorbell maybe take that feed of a camera and apply your facial recognition to it and say, oh, Ben's at the door, even though it's through the ring doorbell instead of like the, you know, the my eye camera. Something like that w would be sure. really cool. Sure, there's lots of possibilities for the future and there's tons of different technologies coming out to help. So it's great to see all this emerging and especially uh, helping in the, oh. in the blind and with their community. Yeah, and and one question I just remembered I was going to ask yeah. earlier. That's uh, obviously for things like books and newspaper. We see the product, you know, the product videos on your website. Uh, they seem to work very well. I'm sure that a lot of Computer America listeners obviously uh, use computer screens and uh, you know, thing in tablets and things like that. How well does the OrCam work with the you know with the OCR? How well does that work on like a computer monitor or a tablet? No, it definitely works right off of it, just like it would a page. So it can read off of any surface. All right, very good. I, I, I was just really worried about, you know, maybe like some kind of screen glare contrast, but... Uh, if, very, I mean, if there's yeah. a light behind you and there's a little bit of glare, it could it probably could have an issue with that. That's definitely a possibility, but I haven't had any issues with people telling me about um, with, with, this, with using a screen. Very, very nice. So tell us about if people want to get if people want to get one, uh, do they have to go to their optometrist themselves and they order it for them? Or is this something that they pick up themselves? Uh, what's the best place or what's the best way to go about uh, trying and getting one? Sure, there's a couple of different ways. One is if anyone out there is a veteran and are visually impaired or blind, that you can get the device through uh, the VA. And they do provide that for uh, visually impaired and blind veterans. So that is a possibility. Uh, everyone else, would the best thing to do is go to the website, www.orcam.com. Uh, on there, and you can fill out a, a little questionnaire, and someone will get in touch with you. You can also speak to your local eye doctors. Uh, you know, pe more people are hearing about it, uh, or your local low vision device distributors, or even local um, associations, like your lighthouses and things like that. So. There, it's out there all over the country. It's actually currently OrCam is in about 23 different countries and speaks also different languages as well. So it's over 13 languages. And I wanted to mention also one more thing for the future because you mentioned you know future sure. uh, uses of OrCam is not only for visually impaired and blind, but also looking into possibly for people with reading difficulties, so like disabilities, learning disabilities. So it's a whole other avenue to look at for the future. 
So, uh, so things like dy uh, dyslexia obviously could, uh, you know, could help as well. And you just put another one in, in my head, which is uh, maybe the ability to read different languages and then immediately translate them into your native language. So, you know, if you're, you know, reading a page in Spanish, it would, you know, vocalize it in English instead so that you could, you know, kind of understand even if you don't really right. understand. So I don't know if that that's in the works, but I think anything's possible. Yeah, it's possible, <laughs> and, and and that's what we like. But uh, you you know, OrCam has obviously put a lot of effort into this. They you know the products look very very streamlined. They look very well to put a word to it, sexy, and you know they're really for a good cause because, uh, as you said before, it's uh, you know the visually impaired have it really hard and. For those who are not visually impaired, it it's really easy to forget just how unfriendly I guess our day to day can be for these people. So, um, hey, uh, you know, Brian, thank you so much for coming on Computer America and telling us about this. And uh, yeah, I, I I'm looking forward to see what OrCam does in the future. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure, our pleasure. So everyone, once again, uh, Dr. Brian Wolinski, he is an optometrist and, a, and of course, a consultant for OrCam. Uh, Brian, have a great day, and uh, thank you so much. You as well. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, and there he goes, everyone. So, yeah, if you want to find out more, orcam.com, O-R-C-A-M.com. And, of course, we have a link to that in the show notes as well. But there you have it. Pretty darn, uh, pretty darn simple, but, of course... Uh, pretty complicated as well. I just, hey, through a simple Google search, I was, uh, you know, I found an article from, let's see, February, February 2017. So the prices probably have not changed that much. Uh, we're looking at a price range of 25 to 3500, which I'm sure is one of the reasons why he was uh, mentioning that you can get it through things like insurance or the VA or other organizations because. Hey, you know, $2,500, $3,500, not the cheapest instrument that we've seen, but for those who, you know, could really benefit from something like this, it's, uh, yeah, it could really be a game changer. So there you go, OrCam, MyCam, or, or I believe it's uh, OrCam My Eye 2 and My Reader 2, two different products, and uh, yeah, very, very cool. So there you have it. We are about to go to break here in just a minute. But of course, in the second part of the program, we will be doing computer and technology news. So why don't we go ahead and uh, just get started. We'll come back to it. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead. So computer and technology news. Here we go. So for today's first news story, we will, of course, start with something very simple, very easy to understand, and that is, of course, the Sony AIBO. If you have never heard of the AIBO, well, congratulations, but we're about to uh, break that streak because the AIBO is essentially a, ro a robotic dog. It is a dog that is a robot made by Sony, I believe, in the early 90s the first time. Yes, you can imagine a robot in the 90s. It was as clunky and ridiculous as it sounds. And I hope, I really do hope that, uh, you know, tw uh, 20 years ago, we look back and say, wow, that was goofy. And I hope that we look at what we are currently going to get with the next generation IBO and in 20 years say, wow, that was clunky, you know, even then. But uh, this one looks a lot different, but is a lot more, uh, you know, hey, a lot more powerful. So Sony, they revamped the AIBO. That was not big news because obviously they released it in Japan a couple of uh, a couple of months ago. But the big news now is that they are heading to the United States, where if you want the pleasure of picking up robotic dog poop, just kidding, one of the perks. If you want to pick one of these up, for $2,900, you too can be sent home with a very complicated toy. So obviously, this will be the sixth generation IBO. And of course, here we go, saying that uh, the article mentions that we knew it wouldn't be cheap. But for Japan, they paid $1,800. And then for the United States, I guess shipping costs a lot. You know, you have to quarantine it and things like that. 
$2,900. So we'll come back with what it can do and more. Music means we're going to take a break. Everyone stay tuned. More Computer America right after this. Greece is cheap. But the airfare costs a fortune. Paris? Not much closer. And again, airfare... What about Puerto Vallarta? Let's face it, flying anywhere is just too expensive. Wait, what's this? Low-cost airlines. With one call to low-cost airlines, you'll drastically slash your travel costs. We're talking insanely low airline prices to any of your favorite destinations. Where would you like to go? London, Rome, Costa Rica, Australia? Wow, that's cheap. So why wait? Call now to learn how crazy cheap it is to fly anywhere in the U.S. or international. Our prices are so low, we can't publish them. The only way to get them is to call to instantly hear the most amazing best deals on airlines travel. It's that easy. So call now and start packing. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. That's 800-215-4461. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. And welcome back to the Computer America Show. It is 32 minutes past the hour as we continue on. And of course, if you miss any part of today's show, we had a very interesting interview just now with Orcam. Orcam talking about their My i2 and My Reader 2. Very, very cool product. If you want to check that out, go to wherever podcasts are heard. And by the way, I just received word, uh, I think yesterday, that we are currently going through the process. The gears are spinning for us to be on Spotify. So we'll let you know when that officially goes through. But Computer America is heading to Spotify. And in the meantime, we are everywhere except Spotify, that you can hear podcasts. So iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, uh, and more. You can, of course, check that out there. But as we continue on, we will, hey, you know, we will be doing computer and technology news. So this is a segment dedicated to all things newsworthy. And we just start and we decided, instead of, you know, some of the more heavy, depressing kind of stories that we could do, to do something light, something easy. And we decided to do, well, Ibo. So Ibo Robotic Dog, $2,900 and will be released in September of this year. But uh, yeah, they said that that seat price gets you the robot dog, a bunch of accessories, and a three-year subscription to Sony's AI Cloud, which will, of course, house Ibo's memories and help it learn over time so that your robotic dog will actually be able to remember, well, who you are. So, you know, and hey, you know, if you're watching the video portion, we're looking at it there. Looks pretty cute. Uh, not bad for a dog, even though it will be infinitely, you know, uh, compared to, a, let's say, a shelter dog, it will be, uh, you know, 10 times the price. But, uh, you know, hey, some people really dig these over, over-engineered toys. So they said, of course, uh, it's one that can learn to recognize your family, including your real life pets, and gain a personality over time. Sony claims that no two IBOs will be alike since they're meant to adapt to your personality and lifestyle. And as we've seen from our preview, and this is of course an article from Engadget, they said that uh, IBO can really move thanks to 22 actuators and a variety of sensors. So this thing is going to be able to Maybe not, you know, go catch that 
duck that you just shot out of the air, you know, some kind of retriever dog, but it will be able to, you know, get around the house just fine. So, you know, and, you know, we're not going to get into every little sensor that this thing has, but suffice to say that Ibo looks cute, it's pretty cool, and hey, for $2,900, you can get one too. So, yeah, you know, there you have it. It's, uh, yeah, <laughs> there's not much more to say about that one. Let's switch gears. No offense, Iba. Let's switch gears to some of our other stories here. And looking through, let's see, what here is actually pretty darn cool. I like this one. I really do. Let's talk about iFixit. So iFixit, if you've never repaired a piece of technology and you were looking through or you were looking for a walkthrough or a guide or some kind of parts list, then you know what? You're going to talk or you're most likely going to end up on a website called iFixit. It's a website dedicated to taking consumer electronics that you know and love, including every generation of the iPhone, of the Samsung phone, of a lot of game consoles, computers, laptops, tablets. They take them, they buy them with their own money, so they're not sponsored or anything like that. Uh, it's completely objective, and they tear everything apart, like down to the smallest screw, and then they give it a score. And that score can be anywhere from you know zero to 10 in terms of repairability. The idea that you should be able to go in with your own two hands and fix whatever gadget that you have, hence the name iFixit. Well, and lately there's been a trend where phones and personal technology and gadgets don't really score that all that well. There's a lot of screw, or not screws, there's a lot of glue, there's a lot of uh, little plastic, cheap plastic bits that can lead to a lot of problems. So, you know, maybe if you, uh, you know, before you buy a device, if you're looking for something that maybe ha uh, has some kind of longevity to it, you would check out I iFixit and you would purchase the item that has, a, you know, maybe an eight in repairability as opposed to a four in repairability. So that if something does break, you can go in and fix it as opposed to maybe potentially shipping it, shipping it off for more uh, which is more expensive or, you know, heaven forbid, uh, just trashing the whole thing. So, yep, not sponsored by iFixit or anything like that. Just really do enjoy the service. And, well, they just did a teardown of one of the, uh, yeah, and, and they just did a teardown of one of the newest gadgets on the market. And that will be, of course, the Magic Leap 1. So if you've never heard of the Magic Leap, that was the device that you kind of set in front of your keyboard or computer and wave your hands in, uh, kind of on top of it, and you'd be able to manipulate your computer in real time. It was a pseudo virtual reality kind of deal that, uh, that Magic said would be the next way that you would control your computer. Did that actually happen? No. But they were able to take that technology, sell it to a couple of different companies, and of course they were able to, uh, you know, make products under the name uh, still today, and they turned it into a virtual reality headset. Still a very applicable use for what they were doing. Now, we get to the fun part. The fact that it's $2,300 means that even before it breaks, you're probably not gonna tear this thing apart. You're not gonna take it down to the studs to see what's inside of it, to see how to fix it, to see if it's uh, you know using glue or screws or anything like that. No, you're gonna cherish it because $2,300 is a big investment. So this article here, this one from Ars Technica, talking about uh, you know just what they found. And so let's go ahead and start at the beginning saying that uh, this month's Magic Leap One uh, headset is, uh, is no exception to the rule where uh, iFixit has now posted a treasure trove of photos and thoughts on the mixed reality, the mixed reality device's tech, performance, and repairability. So this device is unlike anything we've torn down in the past, which is 
you know, pretty different. Saying that this teardown includes an unusually lengthy explanation of how the Magic Leap's first commercially available headset renders virtual images. This, of course, using Microsoft's HoloLens. And yeah, you can see, you know, the gallery that they have here. You can see pictures of the before product. They look a little goofy. I won't lie to you. They look a little, uh, I guess industrial would be a word, but yeah. So they have all the photos of the befores, the afters, the teardowns. Let's go ahead and get into it. They said among the discoveries, they found four LED arrays, uh, yeah, four LED array of infrared sensors uh, in, uh, is built into each of the headset's lenses, and the sensors are aimed at the user's eyeballs to track their movement. Uh, the headset's lenses are each equipped with six layers, and each layer is dedicated to one color wavelength. And that's three of those lens, uh, le lens layers, there we go, render near focus visuals and other three render far focus content, which doubles Microsoft's own take on the concept. So obviously they're gonna be able to, uh, mixed reality is another term for augmented reality. These will be augmented reality goggles. And that means that they'll be able to identify objects that are far away as opposed to those that are really close and they'd be able to render them separately in real time which is a massive improvement over current ar glasses they just couldn't do that before so let's see let's go ahead and skip down past uh, some of the you know some of the jargon uh yeah which just include like the ram the memory the uh the frames per second the resolution Things like that. You can find it all in the article, which we have a link to in the show notes. But they said that uh, one R source indicates that the bulge in the design and placement is for the sake of reducing elo, uh, electromagnetic distortion, since the ML1 has quite a bit of conductive metal. And additionally, the totem's trackpad is ringed with LEDs, though iFixit doesn't confirm doesn't confirm whether these emit near infrared light for the sake of additional tracking. So iFixit concludes, uh, I'm sorry, they conclude the article by pointing out to, uh, point to an unexpected ally, Palmer Lucky of Oculus fame, gets credit for providing iFixit access to the now torn down headset. And uh, yeah, links of course, all the way over to iFixit if you wanna check out the full blog post. But, um, yeah, I, it, honestly, it looks really, uh, it looks really convoluted, which of course it should be. But at the same time, it looks, um, it appears to be a cut above from other augmented reality headsets that we have seen, which is perfectly okay, perfectly okay. So, yeah, let's uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. So, all right. Clear our minds. There we go. I fix it. That's done. Commercially available. I don't think it'll be really available to consumers, but it's one step forward. And if you really want the privilege of wearing AR, it's it doesn't really have that many applications in the consumer space, but it does in the you know, kind of uh, manufacturing corporate space, things like that. Uh, these are going to be invaluable. And this one looks of course, to be one of the best in the field. So really cool of iFixit to, you know, tear this thing down and see what it's actually made of. There you have it. Okay, switching gears, let's talk about, um, <laughs> all right, let's do this one. So this one from The Verge, and we're talking Facebook, we're talking, uh, we're talking the App Store, and we're talking, of course, Apple who runs the App Store. Turns out that Facebook will pull its data collecting VPN app from the App Store over privacy concerns. So a couple of things there. The first one, anyone out there who is not familiar with a VPN, a virtual private network, it's the idea that you reroute your traffic through a different network so that you hide uh, certain elements of browsing. If I were to just log on to, you know, log onto my computer and start browsing the internet on my home computer, 
anyone who had a, you know, things called like packet sniffers or anyone, uh, including the cable company, government organizations, things like that, they would know that Ben at 6 p.m. was looking at uh, CNN.com and they would know exactly what web pages I saw, what content I downloaded, things like that. That's all kind of quote unquote open information because your ISP collects it all and stores it all and you know other apps such as Facebook's VPN were collecting it. Well, a VPN is meant to reroute traffic so that they don't know that I'm going to, let's say CNN or Facebook or whatever. Instead, there's a couple of in-between jumps that mask, distort, and kind of hide where I'm actually going so that you know, it's not a it's not a direct line. Imagine it kind of zigzagging back and forth through different servers. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why someone would use this. The chief among them, again, being privacy. Well, the thing that was meant to keep you private, safe, secure, was also the thing that was tracking you and keeping information and giving it over to Facebook, where they could then attribute it to a singular person being you and they would store it sell it to advertisers or just otherwise have it on record that defeats the purpose of well yeah a vpn so of course they said that facebook will soon pull a mobile vpn app called uh, onevo protect onava onevo protect from apple's app store after the iphone maker declared it violated the store's guidelines on data collection and this according to the Wall Street Journal so let's go ahead and uh, kind of skip over there so Apple's de decision widens the schism between the uh, uh, schism 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 the schism between the two tech giants over privacy and is and is a blow to Facebook which has used data gathering through the app to track rivals and scope out new product categories so the app, which was of course called the Onevo Project, has been available for free download through the Apple's App Store for years, with updates being approved by Apple's App Review Board. So it's been on the App Store for a long time, but then at the same time, they finally took it down because it was tracking people and like they said, tracking competition. So, this is a well-known technique of big large mega corporations even though the you know companies may not put out you know very precise measurements of uh you know uh, customer engagement customer usage uh how long someone uses it um, how active are they on a certain platform even though those very minute details which you think in a lot of cases would only be available, let's take for instance, uh, Snapchat. You know, how often does someone use Snapchat and how, uh, how long do they use it? Things that you would think would only be available to Snapchat's engineers or C-level uh, you know, or C-level uh, employees. Turns out that through apps such as this or even through paid data through other apps that you may have downloaded, that are tracking your activity on your smartphone, they're able to put all those numbers together, in some cases, just as good as the original owner of the application. So it, it happens all the time. Companies don't want to be left in the dark. Facebook doesn't want to be surprised when Snapchat overtakes them in hours used per month. No, they want to see it coming. They want to head it off and they want to be able to make uh, informed decisions on whether or not they want to buy a company, uh, you know, change their own service to match or compete against another company. This happens all the time. And Facebook would rather not have to pay a third party to get that information. They would rather get that information on their own. The big problem, though, with this whole story is that they were getting it through a service that was meant to really give people privacy to add the to add to the protection of the individuals using it and instead it was doing the opposite it was tracking it was tracking the devices and otherwise just not making people more secure but actually less so 
So the article continues saying that earlier this month, Apple officials informed Facebook that the app violated the new rules in June, which designed to limit data collection by app developers. And of course, the person familiar with the situation said, Apple informed Facebook that Onevo also violated a part of its developer agreement that prevents apps from using data in ways that go beyond what is directly relevant to the app or to provide advertising, the person said. Like I said, by them collecting data on what people are doing on their phones and using that to better or at least further their other projects besides Project Onevo, they violated the rules that said, hey, you know, if you're not collecting data to directly help or inform your current or at least the app that it's being collected through, then you're no better than spyware. You're no better than any other malware that is collecting data for a completely different reason than the one that it's on your phone for. So the two sides discussed the issue in meetings last week, and at least one of which took place at Apple's headquarters. And on Thursday, Apple officials suggested that Facebook voluntarily take down the Enovo app and Facebook agreed, who described the discussion as, well, cordial. So the app won't vanish from people's phones who have already downloaded the app, but Facebook will no longer be able to push updates uh, of the app. And Onevo will still be available on Android devices. So if you have it, you can still keep it, but just know that if you're looking for updates until they update the terms of service and actually decide to stop doing what they're doing, I don't foresee any kind of updates, uh, you know, being pushed to it. I don't think that the project is dead, obviously still available through Android, but development has certainly stalled while Facebook decides their best options. And, uh, and let's see some, uh, let's see melter of snowflakes in the chat room said violating people's privacy through a program that was meant to protect people's privacy. And he said, well, Facebook and, yeah, you know, obviously we've pointed out uh, that little conundrum over this exact product, uh, you know, a couple times so far this interview, but the very end of his statement, well, Facebook, Facebook is there to collect data as much as they serve you ads, as much as, um, you know, any, anything else that they provide, they are a huge, huge multi hundreds of billion dollar company simply for the fact that they have information on you as an individual. That's how they, they, that's how they make their money. That's how they will continue to make their money. And anything that Facebook does is to augment or make better their mission, which is to make, which is to know you as an individual and better yet as a consumer better than you know yourself. There's nothing, even privacy-wise, that they may push out that is going to violate that bottom line, which is make money off of personal data. Don't mistake it. Don't think that they're your friend. They are a business. Nothing wrong with that. It's just how much are you willing to give up for it? And there you go. So they said that's a, let's see, uh, Wednesday's move comes several months after Apple and Facebook executives uh, sparred publicly over their different approaches to data privacy, where Apple's chief executive, Tim Cook, was critical of Facebook's practices and contrasted them with Apple's, which he said were more respectful of users' privacy. Uh, Facebook chief executive Mark Zuckerberg called the remarks extremely glib. Hey, you know, if you're going to call something something, uh, from now on, just call it glib. And they said that the chief operating officer, Sheryl Sandberg, said that she and Mark Zuckerberg strongly disagreed with Mr. Cook's characterization of Facebook. So, yeah, all this, of course, the fallout from uh, the idea that uh, personal data should remain personal. But in the meantime, hey, there you have it. I Project Onevo, let's put it this way. If you aren't paying for your VPN, and as, as much as you love free things, as great as free things are, if you aren't paying for your virtual private network, um, in a lot of cases, in a lot of cases, 
they are not really virtual private networks. They're more data collection tools for the company themselves. VPNs are very expensive to run, and that's why many have a, you know, a decently steep uh, s subscription model. So if you aren't paying for it, if you say it's free, um, it's not going to be that good. There's no two ways about it. And it's going to collect information that you are otherwise trying to keep secure. And the whole thing's just going to be for naught. So I'm not saying that you have to pay for a VPN, but if you are going to use a VPN, look into some of the more well-known VPNs and pay. As much as you don't like to, if you really care about your privacy that much, pay for your VPN. It, uh, it gives you that little bit of reassurance that, hey, they're making money somewhere, so they don't have to make it off of selling my data. So there you have it. And Facebook, again, well, as you said, well, Facebook. So, and uh, yeah, there, there you go. All right, we have time for just one more story, one more quick, 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 quick one. I like this one. So obviously we do the show here only an hour, which is great, but sometimes we're doing some stuff behind the scenes. We are mixing, producing. We are, you know, hey, just working on the show. Stuff that you don't see. And I'll be the first to admit, some headphones, including the ones I'm wearing, they get a little hot. They get a little cramped. It's uh, Headphones are just not a fun thing to use over a long period of time. Well, might have to get my hands on a pair of these because finally someone has decided to, you know, do something about a very obvious problem. And this is by HP, where they've created a pair of gaming headphones, which, you know, gaming, as far as audio files can get, gaming is not bad. But check this out. HP's latest headphones cool your ears down so you can play games for hours, which is a big problem problem. Someone said it's my big Irish head. You know, I take offense to that. But HP has created a set of gaming headphones that are designed to cool your ears down. It sprays water directly into your ears continuously so that it cool... Oh, no, no, it, it doesn't do that. But what it does actually is that uh, while your fingers are likely to tire before your ears set on fire, Good rhyming. Gaming on a PC for hours can be an uncomfortable experience, especially during the summer times. Well, the author over at, uh, I'm sorry. The author who was over at Gamescon. Gamescon is a gaming convention that happened over in Germany. And uh, I believe it's still going on or just happened yesterday, very, very recently. But HP was showing off these headphones over at Gamescon and it's definitely a unique and slightly odd experience. You push the two ear cups toward your ears to experience what I can only describe as a cool, tingling feeling. Saying that it's a strange sensation, but even in the brief few minutes he was wearing the headsets, he said that he did feel slightly cooler. And he said that he'd have to test it for hours to really see if it made a difference while gaming. He did notice the inside of the cups feel very cool to the touch, but the outside heats up as the headset cools the inside. The ear cups also light, uh, light up and the powered over USB, so unlikely HP will create a battery-powered version. That's right. You'd have to come to terms with the fact that, you know what? You, uh, yeah, you're going to have to have these things plugged in. So they look pretty cool. They're, uh, I don't think that they're exactly a liquid cooling they're probably some kind of uh some kind of cooling system 200 bucks available this october i might have to look into this myself but uh i'm glad that someone finally recognizes the problem that headphones get hot it's not new but uh hey maybe we can fix it so everyone music means that we're just about done for today thank you so much for tuning in and uh, for everyone out there in the chat room, everyone out there listening on IRN, and everyone listening to the podcast, thank you so, so much for joining us and enjoying what we do here. In the meantime, we, uh, we'll be back tomorrow at 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern, Monday through Friday, of course, as we talk to, let's pull up the old calendar here, we talk to the one, the only, we missed him earlier this month, so we will, of course, be talking to him uh, 
yeah so we will of course be talking to him tomorrow mr ralph bond yeah ralph bond will be joining us it'll be a lot of fun he's uh, he's a very interesting guest and he'll be fresh off from vacation everyone tune in tomorrow 4 p.m 5 p.m and uh have a great day and hey go pick up an ibo only twenty nine hundred dollars <laughs> until next time everyone 